Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 38. We'll be picking up where we left off last week. It's the Word of God, and it's eternally true. It happened at a time that Judah went down to his, from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw a daughter of a certain Canaanite woman whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezeb when he when she was born. When she excuse me, when she bore him. And Judah took a wife uh, for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother, brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and raise up a seed for your brother. But Onan knew that his seed, the seed would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste his seed on the ground, so as not to give seed to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was, com com excuse me, when Judah was comforted, he went up to Tinma uh, this, to his sheep shears. He and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timna to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping, up, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance of En-Iam, which is in the, on the road to Timna. For she saw Sheila was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, so, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send a young goat of the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until uh, you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave to her and went, on his, uh, and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend to the Adulamite to take the pledge back from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute in, in Ayam at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute was, has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let, them, let her keep the things uh, as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. Moreover, she's, impregnant. she's pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and, sh and let her be burned. As she, had, uh, be as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these things belong, I am pregnant. And he said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I. Since, she did not, since I did not give her, my, give her to my son, Shelah, and he did not know her again. And when the time of her labor had come, she had twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one, one put out a hand, and the midwife took a, and tied a scarlet thread around the hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name is called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread in his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's remember where we are in Genesis. Um, first of all, just broadening the scope, thinking about the book of Genesis. Genesis is divided into ten Toledoths. That's just a Hebrew word that's often translated uh, as generations or accounts or genealogies or descendants. Uh, Peter Lighthart has a help helpful definition of it. He calls it begotten things because it's kind of broader than any English word can fit. And the structure marker, this is the structure marker that Moses uses to identify different sections of the book. And when we transition into another section, a Toledoth is given. 
So the first one we see is in Genesis 2. This is the account, Toledoth, of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made the heavens and the earth. Or again in uh, Genesis 5, this is the book of the generations, Toledoth, of Adam in the day that God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. So we just reached last chapter, the last, the tenth and last Toledoth of the book, um, which goes like this. Uh, these are the generations, or Toledoth, of Jacob. So we have to remember that most uh, of, of the things in this tenth Toledoth concern Joseph. It is described as Jacob and by extension his sons. And so um, we'll see, obviously, our section concerns Judah. So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, the first story is that narrative that we saw last week with Joseph, the dream, the coat, and being sold into slavery. Uh, our section comes on the heels of that story. And the question is, why all of a sudden focus on Judah when we've just been telling a story about Joseph? And if you go down to chapter uh, 39, you'll see it just picks up right where the story left off. Why would the, how would the section relate to what came before and what comes after? Well, I argue that it's to contrast Judah, Judah and Joseph. So uh, as, as character. So Joseph, the younger brother, behaves much better than his older brother, Judah. And we've seen other brotherly contrasts in Genesis, right? Uh, we've got Cain and Abel, we've got Ishmael and Isaac, and we've got Esau and Jacob. This is just another set of brothers being contrasted by the biblical author, by Moses. Furthermore, in each of them, it is uh, the wicked older brother uh, uh, and then the younger, more righteous brother. And then what happens in the next chapter is the most potent contrast we get between the two characters because of, in chapter 39, of course, Joseph refuses Potiphar's wife's advances. And then chapter 38, what's Judah do? Well, he goes into a prostitute. So uh, obviously this is a stark, it's, we're being shown that these are very different people. Um, and interestingly, I'll just as an aside, there's sort of a redemption arc with Judah. We'll see later on in the book that his character does get kind of redeemed. Um, so anyway, but I digress. So now that we've seen how this fits into Genesis, this section that we're in, let's examine our text. So I want us to see two takeaways from the text today. Uh, the first is, don't be like Onan, be fruitful. And the second takeaway is, be covenant-minded like Tamar. So my first point again, don't be like Onan, be fruitful. The story uh, starts with Judah heading off and visiting his friend Hira in the region of Adullam. And there he meets Shua, marries his daughter. She bears him three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Ur, grow, uh, Ur grows up and marries Tamar, so we can tell it's a long period of time where he's growing up. So the story, though it starts on the heels of the last story, it continues on well past the timeline of the last story. It would be probably distracting if the book cut back and forth between the two stories that they were having chronologically. Uh, it's, it's being told in one set here. Um, so Ur grows up, marries Tamar, and then God kills Ur for being evil. Um, we're not told why, but Ur had no sons, so then Judah charges Onan to marry Tamar and to raise up a son in order to carry on Ur's name. So this practice was known as Leverite marriage, but retroactively. Um, the word does not come from Levi. It's actually a Greek, or excuse me, a Latin word, um, lever. So it, it just comes from Latin for husband's brother. Um, so as you heard in our Old Testament reading, this practice, which was just a custom at that time, became codified in God's law um, later on in Deuteronomy 25. So let's look again at Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. So when brothers live together, one of them dies and has no son. The wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out of Israel. So this is obviously more than inheritance, right? This is, a na the, the name uh, is what's in focus here. I mean, we know from elsewhere in the Bible, from Deut Numbers chapter 27, um, in the case of Zelophehad, right, his five daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza, there's a good set of baby names there, um, that women can inherit in Israel, right? This is a, an interesting sort of thing because it kind of goes against a lot of the other customs of that area. But this is, like I said, about the name, more importantly than the inheritance. Um, so name, the name in the Bible is bigger than the way we talk about someone's name. And you probably have picked up on this in your reading. Um, and in fact, it, men are the ones that uniquely carry the name. And this practice starts with Eve, Adam and Eve. Adam names Eve, right? He's, she's named for, by her husband. And then that establishes this practice of women taking their husband's name. 
And then furthermore, God calls the race Adam because, of course, you know, Adam is the first man. It's named for, for him. So also remember that, that in the Bible, names are important, like I was saying. So uh, they're a stand-in for the whole person. One's name is a representation of everything that they are and uh, possess and, and everything about them. So in Proverbs, that means that a good name right, is more valuable than riches. Um, or the third commandment, to not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? It's not to take his name lightly. You have to extol God's name because it's representing God and all that he is. Um, so that, and we also have the significance in the New Testament, praying in Jesus' name, right? We're praying as Jesus. So let's keep uh, tracking with Deuteronomy 25. Um, so, but if a man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate and the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, notice that they're, it, they're trying to persuade him, right? It says, if he persists. The assumption is that they're saying, you, you should really ought to do this. And if he persists, I do not desire to take her. Then the brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders, pull off his sandal off his foot, excuse me, pull the sandal off his foot so the woman pulls it off, and then spit in his face, and then she shall declare, this man has done, uh, excuse me, th thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandals are moved. I think some of the cultural significance is lost in us, but I'll just, I'll try to explain how intensive an action that was. So taking the sand off the foot, the foot sort of the biblical as an idiom represents the naked parts, right? Your, your private parts. And so exposing the foot was at least a euphemism for exposing a man's nakedness. So it's equivalent to basically pulling down the man's pants and pointing at him and ridiculing and saying he's inadequate, right? It's, it's an extreme act of public shame for that man. Now, only the brothers of the deceased were, were only the brothers of the deceased were legally obligated to do this. Um, the nearest of kin could do it, but they weren't legally bound to do so. Um, so we see that with Ruth and Boaz, right? That's a prime example of, of Leverite marriage. Boaz goes to the city gate, right, which is the courthouse of, of, of Judah, or uh, excuse me, of, of Israel. And he meets with the near of kin to Ruth than him, right? And then if you'll recall, the near of kin declined to take uh, Ruth as a wife. And so what do they do? He passes the sandal to Boaz, right? He, just, he doesn't have this ritual of spitting or anything else because in this case, there's no shame attached to it. It's merely a, a, a recognition of the passing of the duty to a further of kin who was willing to redeem her. So there's no shame associated with that. So now Onan has charged him to perform these duties of a Leverite and become Tamar's husband and raise up a son bearing Ur's name. Uh, and then obviously he'll go on. It, this is not like a one and done kind of thing. You saw him a lot, said he's married to her. So they're married. And of course, any other children that they bear will be his children. It's just that first one that receives that, that status as Ur, um, as, of his dead father. So, um, but we all know of course what Onan does instead. He, uh, he knew that the offspring seed, I'm, I'm, and you'll notice earlier I said seed. So the word rendered as seed, I'll give a quick aside on that. Um, it's, it's seed everywhere. It's kind of like seed, 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 seed. So when you spill the seed, it's seed, but then it's also seed when it's offspring. Um, and unfortunately, our, our ESV here and many other modern translations boulderize it and kind of hide the earthiness of the Bible. The Bible oftentimes speaks in earthy ways that we feel a little uncomfortable with, but that's, that's the Bible. So we got to take it at, at, uh, at, uh, as, as the word of God. So anyway, Onan knew that the seed would not be his. When he went into his brother's wife, he wasted a seed on the ground and did not give a seed to his brother. So, and then of course, Yahweh was displeased with this and took his life. Um, so Onan knew that the seed would not be his. So we have to remember, Ur was the firstborn son in this family, right? And firstborn sons receive a double inheritance, a double portion of inheritance. Why? Well, because they were to carry on specifically or acutely the, the father's name and legacy and business and everything else. So they needed more funds and the sort of authority that comes with that to be able to do that. Now, this is a coveted position, right, among brothers. So we see all the fights about it in the Bible. So uh, in order to try and maintain that position, Onan spills his seed on the ground so he doesn't have an heir, doesn't create an heir for his brother Ur, right? And then he doesn't, because if that Ur gets, if, the, if he did um, have, a, have a child with her, that child would then get that double inheritance status that his dead brother had, right? And he wouldn't get it himself. Now, of course, he could have passed it down to Sheila, but then of course he wouldn't get that double inheritance either. So it was really an act of selfishness on Onan's part that he didn't want to raise up a child. Um, he didn't want to lose that coveted status. And of course he dies, so he didn't get it. Um, 
So, uh, and then you'll notice in the text too, it says that when he went into her. So this was a multiple kind of time thing. It wasn't just a one and done thing. He just kept doing this wickedly. So how might the Lord admonish us uh, <clears throat> with this account? Well, you may have heard of the term onanism. It's kind of a more archaic term for the word masturbation. And this is because this is the single most cited text on that matter. And I, I think it works as a proof text against that practice, but I would say probably not as well as maybe like the Roman Catholics who have used it would say, because um, it certainly is a fruitless act, right? You're not, you're not, the, the seed isn't becoming fruit, right? It's being wasted. But I would say more in view is fruitlessness in marriage, I think was something we could draw more out of this text, more justified in doing so. Um, and fruitlessness in our lives in general. So that's what I'm gonna kind of do here for the rest of this point. Um, so in marriage, we use many means to prevent fruitfulness. We'd rather delay having kids to spend time you know, on our own desires. Or maybe we'd rather be more financially comfortable with X number of kids. Or we might look at the ominous headlines out there. We don't want to bring child into a troubled world. But God hates fruitlessness. And he killed Onan because of his fruitlessness. And God has made our testimonies, our bodies, excuse me, as a testimony against or for fruitfulness, right? And against our lack of it. So one of the most lovely qualities of a woman's body, but instruments of her bearing fruit. Right? Hips testify to wombs that carry little ones and breasts testify to nourishing little ones. So there are many ways that our culture, culture tastelessly parades women's bodies and breasts uh, and empties them of their value, you know, intentionally forgetting that they're for fruitfulness. But there's, other, uh, there's another and contrary group in our culture, in even Christian circles, who want to identify breasts as merely for the provision of sustenance and not for marital enjoyment. But it's both, right? Why? Well, because God has intertwined these two aspects. He's intertwined marital enjoyment and fruitfulness. Um, and they're supposed to be linked in our mind. So again, our bodies bear witness against our fruitlessness. What is the injunction in the garden? Well, to be fruitful, right, and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it. Well, with what? Well, with the bodies, right, that God gave Adam and Eve. And we actually see how Adam and Eve were to use their respective bodies based on the way that they're cursed by God. Because God doesn't explicitly tell us, but we can draw it out through inference. Um, what, what part of the body was cursed, and then what field, I'm using that term more broadly, they were supposed to work in their, uh, as a woman or as a man. Um, so God says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you, shall, you will eat the plants of the field. But by the, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <coughs> water down here? Yeah. So man's brow, and I would say by extension man's body, uh, is cursed with sweaty hard work to be fruitful in this earth. And then man's field, which is the ground, which was, he was formed to work, is also cursed. So the field of the ground and man's body. So similarly we see what God says to Eve, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you. So women's childbearing parts are cursed as well, right? The whole process of childbearing. And also her field, which is childbearing, is also cursed. And then her other field, uh, which is her husband, who she's formed to help, right? We know that she was made a helper for Adam. That relationship was cursed, and there'll be now tension between them, namely that she will seek to usurp, usurp his authority. So we see that man's hard body, broad shoulders, Naturally higher mes uh, muscular production were for fruitfulness, right? Fruitfulness working the field of the earth. Similarly, a, body's, a woman's softer body, higher fat production with hips and breasts and thighs, all these were for nurture um, and were for fruitfulness. And the working of her field was, was her home, right? Her, her kids and her husband. So let's remember that these bodies are to be spent on fruitful labors. Um, so for example, wives who who opt for baby formula so that their breasts don't deteriorate are no better than wealthy women of old who would use a wet nurse to maintain their breasts. And actually, it's interesting, if you read through like the Reformation writings, this was called out a lot by, by a lot of the, the, the pastors in the Reformation uh, as, a, as a wicked practice. Because practice. breasts, what, are meant to be spent. Bodies are meant to be spent. As we care for children, you know, when people's hair goes gray when they have kids, um, we, we see that that's actually a glory according to the Bible. That's not a negative thing as your body is spent for your kids. So Proverbs 16, 31 says that gray hair is a crown of honor. And I would say by extension, our spent bodies are a crown as well. Um, so husbands, as your wife spends her body in fruitful labors, remember that your wife's body is your standard of beauty. 
Um, in the Song of Songs, Solomon exalts in the Shulamite's body with all its peculiarities, right? She has a large nose, for example. And the amazing thing about self-consciously delighting in your wife is that even the qualities at one point you might not have liked as much, you start to find that you like them too, as you practice delighting in her. And even as her body is spent, you'll find her attractive in new and exciting ways. And, and then also remember that your bodies are spent in bearing fruit in different ways. So, so men, you know, your bodies are spent. Remember this when you're holding your child, that fruit is heavy. So you think about like a bumper crop and what that does to the, the arms of a tree, right? They bend down from the weight of the crop. Think of that image when your arms are tired and your body is sore from holding your children. Um, it's, it's glory to grow in strength as you suffer under the weight of fruit, both figuratively and literally. So it's not merely married people who are called to be fruitful. No, this is a universal calling for all Christians. So think about the Apostle Paul, right? He's someone who, at least at the time of the writing of the New Testament, was not married. And not, we don't know, he doesn't seem like he has any biological children of his own. And yet, I would say he's one of the most fruitful people in the Bible. So think about how many people could call Paul father spiritually. Um, as he says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, For if you had, were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. So Paul spiritually begot. Uh, lots of, of children, lots of children in the Lord, right? And then he also says he doesn't just beget them, right? He also nurtures them. He says that he bore them as a nursing mother in 1 Thessalonians 2.7. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. So imitate the Apostle Paul in expending yourself, even if you're single or whatever season of life you're in, um, in, in, in bearing fruit for the kingdom. Now, one other way that we're all called to bear fruit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. <clears throat> but the question is, are these fruits for our enjoyment or for others' enjoyment? Well, I would say, obviously, joy and other things. It's clearly for our enjoyment in part, but I would say it's also for others because fruit is meant to be eaten, right? So figuratively speaking, uh, <clears throat> when we're kind to them, we're feeding people. When we're kind to people, we're feeding people. When we're gentle, we're feeding people. When we're patient, we're feeding people. This is sustenance for other members of the body. And so we see this in Paul's discussion of fruit uh, in Galatians 5. So that, that's the verse we get that list of the fruit of the Spirit. And starting in verse 15, just backing up a little bit, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not to turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. We're not to eat anybody, right? That's, that's, the, that's his exhortation there. And then what happens immediately after? Well, then he talks about the fruit of the spirit. We're not to eat people is the implication. We're to feed people. That's the opposite of eating and devouring and biting people, um, figuratively speaking. <clears throat> so saints, be fruitful for God's sake and for the sake of one another. Don't be selfish like Onan. He was not only unfruitful, he was not mindful of the covenant, for he cared only for himself, unlike Tamar, I'll argue, which brings us to our, to our second point, which is be covenant-minded like Tamar. So again, be covenant-minded like Tamar. So we've seen that we should not be like Onan in his wicked unfruitfulness. Now we'll see how we should follow Tamar's example of covenant-mindedness, what I'm calling that. So now I would imagine that there are some objections raising in your minds um, how are we supposed to imitate Tamar, right? She dressed it up and asked, acted like a prostitute. Well, I'm going to just take Judah's words in verse 26 at face value when he says, she is more righteous than I at face value. Um, and just say that she is righteous and justified in this story. But before I can make this claim, I need to lay some more groundwork. So let's look at the story again. So Onan was unfaithful, right? God killed him. After that, Judah sends Tamar to her father's house, telling her to wait there until Sheila is old enough to marry her. However, secretly in his heart, he doesn't want her to, to marry her son because it kind of seems like Judah thinks that, uh, she, that maybe Tamar's cursed or something. He, he clearly is thinking in terms of like, oh, Sheila's going to marry him. He's going to die too. Um, and if Sheila dies, well, then what happens? He, he doesn't have any heir at all. So this fear of Judah is only heightened then when his wife then dies. So um, it's after, right after that his wife dies. So now his opportunity for more sons is gone. Um, and this builds up tension for us, too, as we know the whole story, uh, thinking about Judah, right? We know Judah is the, the line that the, the promised seed of the woman was going to come from, the promised Messiah. And it almost looks like it's about to get cut off here. What are we going to do? 
So in doing this because of fear, he was trying to protect Shelah from preventing his marriage. So he uh, was wickedly treating this seed, Judah, as if it were his own, as if he could possess it and keep it, but not recognizing that it's God's, especially in this line that was going to be bringing about the Messiah, as we saw in Matthew. So the stakes were high, and we see that Tamar, with these stakes being high, acted fairly audaciously. So as you already know, um, she drawns the robes of a harlot. She goes to where she knows Judah. The widower will be walking, right? And then he, she, he propositions her and gives her the staff and signet ring as a guarantee that he'll pay her with a goat later. And then he sends the baby goat, and then she doesn't give back the signet ring or any of his other elements of um, collateral. And so we see here in that element of the story uh, an interesting sort of biblical motif that, kind of, that comes up a lot. So in the garden, right, the woman is deceived by the serpent, but then lex talionis, right, this sort of poetic justice throughout the rest of the Bible is women deceiving wicked serpent-like men, right? So we can think of Jael deceiving Sisera. We can think about uh, the Hebrew midwives deceiving Pharaoh, right? That, that women then practice deception as a sort of a turning around of what happened in the garden. So Tamar here deceives Judah, who's acting serpent-like. Um, so three months later, and there you have a very significant biblical uh, uh, in, in number of time, three, um, Tamar's pregnancy is told to Judah, and then he pronounces this death sentence on her. And then, of course, he's presented with the staff and the signet ring and the cord, and, and then he says, okay, she's more righteous than I, in so much as I did not give her my son, Sheila. And so I think there we see Judah's repentance and a turning of his character in the story. So Tamar then moves into uh, his house, right? But says that she never knew him. So she wasn't like a, a, a wife in that respect, but, uh, but she gives birth then to twins, Zerah and Perez. And these twins, I would say, are a gracious sort of replacement from the word of Ur and Onan. Um, and then again, we have this, con this idea of the wicked older brothers being replaced by younger brothers. So that pattern, again, when we, if we think typologically, that's the pattern of the Bible, right? You've got the first Adam being replaced by the second Adam, which is Christ, the younger, the younger brother, right? So with all that in view, I'm arguing that we should imitate Tamar. And am I tacitly saying then that the ends justify the means? No, <laughs> I'm not saying that. And uh, sin is still sin, but we need to recognize that God draws strict with, uh, straight with crooked lines. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't call out uh, sin, right? It's totally not okay to be a prostitute. Make, make sure you hear that. But that being said, she was being saved through her childbearing, right? I mean, we see her name called out in, New, in the New Testament, in Matthew's genealogy. And I would say this is a tacit commendation of her as well. You know, it was her covenant-mindedness is seen when Judah wickedly deprives her of what she was due. And then she goes, she has the tenacity to seek a son from the next unmarried, of, you know, nearest of kin, which would be Judah. So in her covenant-mindedness, there is something for us to imitate. Um, this means that we need to see our place in the Ark of Redemption. I, I'm arguing that she saw her place. She, she understood how she should act because she knew where she was in the story of God's covenant unfolding. Um, so Judah forgets about these promises, right? And he, he then turns in unbelief, fearing that he'll lose the son. So he's not being covenant-minded, but Tamar is. So you must instead do what you know to be right, even though it might not add up at this moment from your perspective. That's what it means to be covenant-minded in your actions. Um, so you, you do what you're supposed to do and let God do the math. Um, but we see this, we see a few chapters ago in chapter 35 that Jacob, this is another example of covenant mindedness, Jacob acting faithfully to the covenant. So back in 35, uh, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods, which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me ever, uh, wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they, which they had and the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities that were around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob acted by faith. And he, he trusted God's words. He knew, he put, both, he put away the foreign gods, which God didn't tell him to do, but that was the right thing to do. And then what did he do? He followed God's command to go to Bethel. 
And he didn't fear what could happen along the way. And guess what? God then put fear in the hearts of their enemies. His covenant mindedness meant that God blessed him with, with protection. Um, so we, this is what we ought to do also by faith. In the, we should, yeah, according to the covenant, we should trust God with the results. We should act according to the covenant, trust God with the results. So furthermore, we ought to imitate, imitate Tamar in what I call covenant audacity. So Jesus, in Luke 18, gives us the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. So after giving uh, this parable, this persistent widow, right, she persist persistently is annoying this judge, this unjust judge, to, to submit to her cause, and then eventually he does. He yields to her. And then Jesus says that we ought to do similarly. We ought to wear God out, so to speak, um, for we ought at all times to pray and not lose heart, right? That's the reason Jesus told that parable. Similarly, we see Jesus in the way he interacts with the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus keeps pushing her away, even going so far as to, to indirectly call her a dog. And then what does she, she, she do? She pushes through. She doesn't give, he, he, she pushes through Jesus' resistance to her. And then he says to her, oh woman, your faith is great. It shall be done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed. So God loves covenant audacity. He loves this, this intensity, this willingness to, to, to pursue God. So remember that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force, right? We must be men who, men and women who siege, besiege heaven with our prayers. So Spurgeon's got a great quote on that. He says, there's no pleading with God like reminding him of his covenant. Get a hold of the promise of God. And you may pray with great boldness for the Lord will not run back from his own word. If I may compare a single promise to one great gun in the heavenly siege train, then the covenant may be likened to a whole park of artillery with which you may besiege heaven and come off this conqueror. So the covenant promises are weapons in our hand against God. It's, it's, it's a stunning image, but I think, it's, I think it's in line with this audacity that I'm commending. Well, what does this look like for us? Well, keep praying for Lauren Trotter. You know, and don't lose heart. Keep praying for barren wombs here and don't lose heart. There's all kinds of things that we pray for and we pray for and we pray for. Don't lose heart. Keep besieging heaven. Keep besieging heaven with covenant promises. That's what our heavenly father is pleased to see us do. So we've seen that we're to be fruitful, not like Onan, and that we're to follow Tamar's covenant mindedness and covenant audacity. And let's remember to do this all by faith, right? Recognizing that anything we do is because of the promised seed has already come. So what do, we, what do we see in Genesis 38 of the gospel? Well, I think we can see the promise of Christ typologically in this story. For Adam is our older brother who God killed. And therefore, like Ur, he does not have any seed because he's dead. Thus, because he's dead, he cannot fulfill the cultural mandate to be fruitful and to multiply because he's dead. And as an older brother, no savior can be born uh, of him into the world by the seed of the woman, right? That's the promise. And because the, first, uh, brother, because the older brother, the first Adam, has been killed, the bride has been left a widow. So she needs, to be, needs there to be a second Adam as a husband for the bride. She needs a kinsman redeemer, right? To use the language that we find in, in Ruth. So where the first Adam failed, the second Adam will be fruitful and multiply. And his seed will come forth, will fulfill the cultural mandate. And redemption will be applied to the world. Well, How? Well, through the second Adam and his bride, both, right? No one has been converted by themselves, right? It's always, it, obviously, it's by the spirit's instrumentality that makes men alive, spiritually speaking, but it's the instrumentality of the church as well. Um, and no one can have God as father if he will not have the church as his mother. It takes both a bride and the second Adam to bring about a new seed, spiritually speaking. Um, so as the Ethiopian eunuch says to Philip, how can I understand the Bible except some man teach me it? You need both. The second Adam has taken the widowed childless bride and has raised up children. And here we are. We live in a blessed time that Tamar and Jacob and Ruth all longed for. We, we can through our baptism, excuse me, and we through our baptism have been brought into Christ. We bear his name, right? And we will do so forever. Um, the practice of Levite marriage was for maintaining the name after death, right? Well, but since Jesus lives forever, that practice has ended. There's no need for it. His name will be ours forever. For Christ's name is kept through baptism and the maintaining, uh, not by the maintaining of the Levite law. 
So we see in Acts that we are called Christians, right? At Antioch, first called Christians. We bear Christ's name. And he who has eternally, eternally named us will be faithful to us till the end. 